I've been with WNET for 10 years. We are a public broadcaster. We operate channel 13 and channel 21 here in New York. We're the producer or presenter of some of the key PBS uh, programs, including Nature, Great Performances, American Masters, Charlie Rose, uh, The News Hour, the most trusted video content available. And we have a very strong partnership with educators, particularly K through 12. Um, I've been counseling producers and educators on rights. I've produced films myself, and so I understand the whole rights process from the edit room perspective and the headaches of the brainstorms and calling up the lawyers and, 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 and being the lawyer. Um, so I want to give a, a little bit of perspective from the trenches and put it in the context of what's going on in the commercial world, because the whole notion of free rights and fair use and creative commons is a little port in a big storm that's going on, and it's a very important uh, port. Um, I just want to cover a couple of basics. I'm going to try to do this quickly so we have a lot of time, first of all, for Eric to uh, talk about the second part of his presentation, which is critical, and for there to be time for discussion. Um, traditionally, the way we negotiate rights is with, uh, we, we, we negotiate them in terms of manner and media, territory and term. And remember that trinity, because it isn't going to be here for much longer. We also negotiate in terms of exclusivity, and exclusivity is critical to any rights package today. But that's also going to change. The bottom line is negotiations for rights are about money, trying to give up as few rights as possible for as much money as you can get, or the other way around, paying as little for as much as you can get. That's always the tension. That's what's going on in most of the world. The market and the prices for these rights are driven on how we monetize viewership of video content. And that happens in two ways. Either a pay-to-view model, like a movie theater or a DVD sale or rental, or free view supported by ads or sponsorship, like television, the web, even public television. And technology is changing viewership radically and quickly, and more so now than ever before. The internet is now a high-end video portal. Computers are now video receivers and playback devices. iPods are offering a whole new format. This change in viewership is changing where we monetize viewership. And I want to put up, well, you've got it, this one slide, which illustrates the tipping point that's going on in our industry. Look at where the ad dollars are spent today compared to viewership. This is a slide that, that shows the, the green lines are the money spent, the red lines uh, represent viewership. And if you look at the top line, you're going to see how out of whack our ad spending is. Print is spending six times its share, or 60% or of its money, uh, sorry, six times its share uh, compared to the viewership of print. So you've got 6% of the population reading and 30% of the money is going into reading, is going into advertising on print material. The internet is, the, uh, is, is half. We're spending half our money advertising on the internet, but double the amount of time. This is all going to rationalize in the next 18 months, and you're going to see that the spends and the viewership are going to be equal uh, through each category of media. And th the reason this is so critical is what's happening in the commercial world is going to change how we think about rights and how we define them. With the internet and TV convergence, uh, linear and on-demand programming are all going to come to your house through one box if they're not already doing that. Uh, you're one click of a mouse or remote control away from whatever you want, whether it's pay, pay to view it or ad supported free viewing. And with these new models, we're going to have very interesting new deals in terms of how we distribute content for money. There are going to be combinations of pay to view and ad supported. There's going to be, it's, it's all going to be happening in your box seamlessly, but the deals behind the scenes are going to be right now very complicated because we're figuring them out and no one's quite sure how they're going to make money. The record industry has been wrestling with this for five years. Uh, and I see all the Apple computers in the room and that's the guy who's figured out a big piece of it. Um, uh, it's really stunning how many little apples I'm looking at. Uh, one, one Sony, 25 apples, <laughs> and a Dell. <laughs> um, so remember the trinity, manner and media, territory term, exclusivity, or all in terms of exclusivity. 
with these new formats, well, when, we, when we'd add a new technology, the Trinity would just add that format to Manner and Media. For example, DVD came along, and you just had Manner and Media, t TV, Internet, now DVD. Uh, the Territorian term were just some logical extension of what should a DVD uh, life in the marketplace be. Today, I'm not sure that manner and media matter anymore. TV, DVD, cable, VOD, internet, it's all coming in your house in, in, through one screen. So we don't need that definition. The distinctions are, again, differences without a real distinction. Territory, well, the web doesn't really tolerate borders. And while there are geo filters out there and some companies are using them and some of us are getting asked to use them in our licenses, they're really not practical for popular culture content or broadly distributed content. And I think in the end of the day, they're going to go away. I don't think the marketplace is going to tolerate them. So I think territory is uh, over time going to disappear as a relevant uh, part of the trinity. And term, well, once it's on the internet, there's no pulling it back. So I think term is really uh, going to become irrelevant. And I think we're going to think about uh, defining or describing rights. Instead of using that, that trinity of descriptors, we're going to think of end users. We're going to think of, are they at home? Are they in a classroom? Are they looking at it on their little iPod or wristwatch? Or are they in a theater? And how are they paying for it? Are they paying to view it, or is it ad supported? So let's look at how this would impact a rights definition for home video. Typically, home video is defined as DVD, sale or rental. Well, now it's going to be home use. And it's going to mean the purchase or rental for viewing at your home. Who cares how it got there? TV is now going to encompass broadcast, cable, satellite, internet. Again, who cares how it got into your home? It's an ad-supported stream of linear programming. And that's going to be the definition. And it's going to be about how do the rights holders get their money? And what about exclusivity? We always describe our trinity in terms of I've got these exclusive rights. I'm not sure that exclusivity is going to be relevant the same way it has been in the past. I'm on the fence about this, but if you look at things like YouTube and MySpace and all the new sites that the public flocks to to look at video, we all want our content there. And the fastest way to get it there is to let the public put it there and post it, just like the fastest way in the educational market for people to use and exploit video is to let the educators, the teachers, and the students just start using it. That's how it's going to get there. That's the quickest way. We're not even going to know as a producer or distributor which the best site is. The hottest site just, you know, is suddenly there today, gone tomorrow, it all moves someplace else, and I want my content there, but I want to make money on my content. And that's what we're wrestling with. How am I going to make money if my content's posted all over the place? There's always going to be a place for exclusivity. If you look at feature films, there's always going to be this windowing where certain content is going to be, uh, there, there'll be a, a premium in the marketplace. Uh, but again, I think the, the, the notion that non-exclusive was sort of an odd term of art before uh, and something that lawyers and business affairs folks were uncomfortable with, I, I don't think that's going to happen anymore. Um, so I think it's in play. What does this all mean for best practices? I think it's a little early to start saying we know what the best practices are going to be. But I think the, the, the bottom line is we need to tag and track our content so that we can collect money. And that ties right into what's going on in the education market today. We're looking at our archives and we're looking at how we can use video clips in, in, in the classroom and how people can swap these things and expand on them. And what we need to have is a way to, you, you, you've got to have an archive, you've got to manage your archive, and you've got to deal with the insane cost of building and managing that archive. And that's the big challenge for public television and the big challenge for educational institutions. The, the, the commercial entities haven't figured out how to do it either. There's no perfect system. There's, I think, five hot software products out there now. None of them are, are terrific. They all have pros and cons. They're very expensive. Um, so I think we need to think about how we're going to manage our archive. And I think that's a place where public broadcasting and the education market can, can really collaborate. Uh, we're, we're working right now with NYU, WGBH, PBS, and the Library of Congress on uh, the American Archive, which I think you guys heard about yesterday. 
Uh, that's a great example of collaboration. The other thing we need is we need some changes in the law, and I think we can collaborate on that as well. If you look at what the copyright law does for educators and public broadcasters, it gives us free music for public broadcasting. Well, broadcasting is going to go with the Trinity. It's not, it doesn't matter how it gets into your home anymore, yet it's only free if it's broadcast. So we're going to have to rethink what public broadcasting means in the Copyright Act. Uh, it also gives schools, and I love this one, seven days to record what I broadcast on public television and then replay it in the classroom, as if you're going to be doing in your <coughs> curriculum what I've done on American Masters Wednesday night. Thursday morning, a teacher's going to be in there talking about Ella Fitzgerald because, well, let's put you know, the, the U.S. Revolution on hold and let's talk about Ella Fitzgerald. It doesn't work. It never worked. And we need to change that. Classroom use of public television media has, has and that's, that's such a simple fix. I think we could lobby together to make that happen. Uh, there are some other things we should be thinking about in terms of uh, changing the Copyright Act to support the things that Eric's group is doing and, and the other things that universities and public broadcasters are doing. And I think that the, the critical thing um, I'm just looking at some of the other comments I had. I wanted to, I really want time for us to talk about these things. Um, I think the critical thing as we look at all this is to remember that the big mover in the market is always going to be money. And whatever we do is going to have to look at what are the commercial models and how can we take advantage of those models and how can we find a place among those models where no one feels like we're ripping them off but in, instead bringing our social value. Uh, into the education market, into public broadcasting, out to the public. Thank you.